Scary events are known to happen in prisons. In fact, it can be regarded as one of the most dreaded institutions anyone can be sentenced to. Regardless, some people commit heinous offenses and are sent to prisons not just to serve a particular time, but are given capital punishment, the death row. Some of the inmates sentenced to this capital punishment are greatly feared and regarded as the most dangerous. To satisfy all curiosity, we have gathered several details about these people in the prisons they were sentenced to for you to see. Join us as we explore a day on the most dangerous death row in the world. Indiana State's Prison About 50 miles east of Chicago, located in Michigan City, is the maximum security Indiana Department of Correction prison for adult males, also known as the Indiana State's Prison. Established in 1860, it houses all the male death row inmates in the state. The institution has housed famous inmates like John Dillinger and D.C. Stevenson. Being the institution that houses all the adult inmates on death row in the state, all the executions carried out before 1913 was done by strangulation. Until February 20, 1914, when the first electrocution happened. This practice continued from 1914 till 1995, before the lethal injection was introduced and used to this day. However, there are some death row inmates still detained in the Indiana State's prison, waiting for their last day, with some of them having no appeals left. These inmates are the worst of the worst and considered the most dangerous in the world. At the top of this list is Eric D. Holmes, who was convicted of homicide and conspiracy to commit robbery. Holmes was 21 when he got fired from his job at Shoney's Restaurant after he was involved in an argument with his co-worker Amy Fauci. As he finished work on the day that he was fired, Holmes did not go home immediately. He laid at ambush, waiting in the parking lot with a man known as Michael Vance. Fauci left work with managers Teresa Blossy and Charles Irvin, who was carrying the restaurant's receipts. On their way out, they got accosted by Holmes and Vance, who trapped them in the restaurant's foyer and attacked them, then grabbed the money before running. Blossy and Irvin couldn't make it, but Fauci survived the ordeal. This led to Holmes' arrest and being sentenced to death row penalty, while Vance was tried separately and sentenced to 190 years. Holmes was sentenced in 1993 but is still at the Indiana State Prison today, awaiting his final moments. Another inmate at the Indiana State's prison is Michael Dean Overstreet, convicted of assault, molestation, and the confinement of Kelly Eckert. Kelly Eckert was an 18-year-old freshman at Franklin College who worked part-time at Walmart. On September 27, 1997, Eckert had left work and met briefly with her boyfriend before driving towards her home in Shelby County. Sadly, that was the last time she was seen alive. The following morning, Eckert's car was abandoned in a remote area, with its lights on and keys still in the ignition. This led to the investigation going on about her whereabouts before her body was found four days later. It was found particularly unclothed in a rave in Brown County and the autopsy found out she was assaulted with her own shoestring and a strap from the suspender of her overalls. She has also several bullet wounds to her forehead, and semen was discovered on her, which was linked to Overstreet through DNA analysis. He was sentenced on July 31, 2000. In 2014, a judge ruled Overstreet as not competent to be executed. Still, he remains on death row. The Indiana State's prison also has Benjamin Ritchie on its death row list. Ritchie was convicted of homicide, possessing an unlicensed firearm by a serious violent felon, auto theft, and resisting law enforcement. Ritchie was found by Beach Grove police officer Matthew Hickey when the police officer saw a white van similar to the description of a van that was stolen earlier that evening. Upon confirming the details, Hickey chased the culprit and was joined by Sergeant Robert Mercury and Officer William Tony, each of them driving separate cars. The chase continued until Ritchie wrecked the van and ran. Still, Officer Tony was hot in his pursuit as he chased him across several yards. Unfortunately, Tony suffered bullet wounds from Ritchie's weapon. William Gibson is also a member of death row list in the Indiana State's prison. Gibson was convicted of attacking Christine Wittes in 2013 a family friend who visited him in his new Albany home to console Gibson after his mother's death. The body was found in his garage by Gibson's sister, who came home to visit her brother but didn't see him because he had gone to a local bar with Wittes' minivan. 
Hurriedly, Gibson's sister called the police. During the investigation, the police found the body of a woman that had gone missing buried in his backyard. He was also connected to a 2003 killing and awaiting trial in those cases while on death row in the Indiana State's prison. There's also the case of Roy Lee Ward, who was convicted of homicide and criminal deviant misconduct. His victim was a 15-year-old, Stacy Payne, when Ward came back to attack her when she was alone in their rural Dale, Indiana home with her sister Melissa. Melissa, who was 14 then, was napping upstairs when she heard Stacy's screams. Running out, she saw Ward on top of Stacy with a pen knife in his hand while Stacy pleaded for him to stop. Ward was on probation for a burglary in Missouri at the time and had several convictions for public indecency and decent exposure so he was arrested for Stacy's murder right at the scene before being taken to the Indiana State's prison, where he awaits the death penalty. On the list also is Joseph E. Cochran. Cochran was sentenced to death row on August 26, 1999, based on his conviction of homicide. Cochran was living with his brother, James Cochran, his sister, Kelly Nieto, and her fiancé, Robert Turner. His brother and his sister's fiancé were talking about him with two of his brother's friends, Timothy Bricker and Doug Stilwell. So he became angry about the situation. In his anger, Cochran put his seven-year-old niece in an upstairs bedroom before returning to assault his brother, his two friends, and Turner, all four suffering bullet wounds. It was after the assault, Cochran went into a neighbor's house and told them to call the police. He is still within the walls of the Indiana State's prison awaiting his last day. Most of these men on death row list have exhausted their appeal but have not been executed yet. Why is that so? This is because the state is having issues obtaining the drugs required to conduct an execution, therefore leaving a total of eight men to remain on the prison's death row, waiting anxiously. On the death row list, the longest inmate in prison has lived 29 years awaiting execution, while the latest member on the list has waited eight years. This delay in executions in Indiana has caused some prosecutors to doubt if there will ever be successful sentencing. The defendants that once stood for the awaiting death row inmates are concerned for them as they wake up every day and return to bed under the threat of death. It seems to only be Indiana that has this issue though, as other states, like Oklahoma and Texas, have continued with their executions. The last time the state of Indiana executed a man on death row was December of 2009 when it executed Matthew Eric Wrinkles. Since then, the state has left other men on the death row list with no order for execution and no dates set, and they reside in the Indiana State Prison in Michigan City to this day. They were not left on purpose, by the way, but due to the state's inability to get methahexyl, pancurium bromide, and potassium chloride. These materials are part of the ingredients that are used in the lethal injection drug cocktail to be administered to the convicted. As Indiana tried to find out if they were the only ones struggling to get these products, they found out that other governments had also been unable to get the drugs. This is because the pharmaceutical manufacturers in recent years have changed their minds in supplying their drugs to prisons, as they do not want their drugs, which are originally produced for therapeutic purposes, to be used for executions anymore. However, not all governments in the United States struggle to get drugs for lethal injections. States like Texas have switched to a single drug protocol of pentobarbital. Despite Indiana State Prison's inability to perform executions, six states have executed 17 people in 2022, according to the Death Penalty Information Center, a nonprofit that tracks death penalty data and disseminates reports. Texas's Department of Criminal Justice, having conducted five of the 17 executions this year, only utilizes pentobarbital in their executions, according to Director of Communications Amanda Hernandez. Questions were asked if her agency has had to deal with any difficulties in getting the drug, but Hernandez simply responded saying, we have ample supply. That being said, let's head into the most dangerous death row inmates in Texas. Since the state reinstated the death penalty in 1976, Texas has been executing prisoners mostly in the United States. With over 150 inmates awaiting the death penalty, the state might be awarded the busiest execution chamber in the country. Some executions have been scheduled up until next year, one of which is the case of John Lazelle Ballantyne. Ballantyne, who was convicted of homicide and sentenced in 1999, has been on the death row list for 23 years and 5 months. Ballantyne was guilty of attacking three youths in their sleep when in the early hours of January 21, 1998, he snuck into a home he used to share with Misty Kaler, 
As he got inside, he assaulted three teenagers as they slept, with each victim suffering bullet wounds to their heads. After the incident, Valentine fled to New Mexico but was tracked till he was arrested in Houston where he confessed to his crimes. Valentine has had a pretty long portfolio in his criminal history, starting from 1983. He started with burglary and theft of property when he robbed a high school building and stole several rifles and pairs of military fatigues. Three years later, he broke into a Walmart store and tried to steal a large number of firearms. What does he plan to do with all that ammunition anyway? However, he was convicted of attempted theft of property due to the Walmart case and got sentenced to prison for five years. In 1989, he committed another robbery and received an additional five-year sentence for it. In November of 1996, he committed a crime again, breaking into a home in Arkansas and forcing the female resident into a two-door car. Thankfully, the female resident escaped when Ballantyne stopped to get cigarettes at a convenience store. His final straw came in 1998 while he was awaiting transfer to Potter County based in the capital murder charge. Ballantyne decided not to comply with the sheriff deputy of Harris County. He became uncontrollable to the point where several deputies had to restrain Ballantyne, who kept fighting for freedom. However, he is scheduled to be executed on February 8, 2023. A spectacular inmate on this list is a former Missouri City police officer named Robert Allen Frada, who was convicted of hiring two hitmen in order to assault his recently divorced wife in 1994. When the whole situation was examined, prosecutors said that Robert Frada was influenced by money and a custody battle over the couple's three children, which was happening at the time due to the divorce. During this period, Farah was assaulted and her neighbors found her lying in the garage of her home with two bullet wounds. Frada was caught with two hitmen that did the job he requested confess their crimes to the police. He was arrested and then taken into custody before being tried and awarded the death penalty, adding him to the death row list. He is scheduled to be executed on January 10, 2023. There are still other inmates on death row, some as old as over 90 years, waiting for their final day. One such inmate is David Carpenter, also known as the Trailside Killer. Carpenter was known and convicted for tracking and assaulting women on hiking trails near San Francisco, California. Carpenter's first suspected victim was 44-year-old Etta Kane, who decided to go hiking in the Mount Templis State Park on August 19th. The following day, Etta Kane was found with a bullet wound in the back of her head. He went on to assault two more women along with the hiking trails while he was living with his parents. He continued this abominable act discreetly until an eyewitness saw the attack take place and ran to law enforcement to give an account of the incident and a description of the attacker. However, the description turned out to be wrong. When the rangers got to the crime scene, they found a pair of prison-issued glasses at the crime scene, and that sparked their intuition to search for potential suspects among convicted offenders. Sadly, they found no promising leads. Since he lost his glasses, Carpenter went to buy a new one, but he wasn't suspected as he did not match the description explained by the eyewitness. Although he was noticed to have sustained an injury at the attack, Carpenter claimed to have suffered the injury from a robbery. As he roamed freely, he committed crimes, assaulting women who went jogging into the woods and hiking too. By the time people saw strange events happening in the area, they had become certain that there was a predator in the area and warned one another to stay away from the nature paths. In a bid to transform his modus operandi, Carpenter deceived his last known victim, Heather Skaggs, by arranging with her to sell him a used car. At this time, law enforcement had been watching his every move. When Skaggs was nowhere to be found in her home and workplace, the investigators now a task force made up of multiple agencies comprising local law enforcement's agencies to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, had been watching him due to his past relationship with Skaggs as they once had been in a relationship. Another reason Carpenter could move Scott free was that he served a federal sentence at the time. When he was eventually trialed and arrested, the multitasking force of investigators searched his car and they found different guides to local hiking trails. They also recovered some of the tools Carpenter used in his assaults, which he left with a friend. At the time of his arrest, other eyewitnesses presented themselves with their parts of their stories, placing Carpenter in his car at the locations of several attacks perpetrated by him. All these while, Heather Skaggs has not been found yet. Her body was eventually found under some bushes. Of eight homicide cases related to Carpenter, he was not charged in three of those cases due to lack of evidence. Still, he was put on trial and found guilty of five other murders, which made him sentenced to be executed in the gas chamber. This is where he remains to this day, in the San Quentin prison death row. 
He is the oldest member there, currently at the age of 92. David Carpenter is not the only one awaiting death row at the San Quentin prison. Randy Kraft, also known as the Scorecard Killer or the Freeway Killer, is on the death row list. Seeing Randy Kraft outside on a normal day, he was a prominent computer programmer that worked in sunny Southern California. But deep inside, the computer programmer is a lethal criminal suspected of committing over 50 to 60 murders. His attacks are believed to have started in the early 1970s and continued until he was arrested in 1983. His victims were all male and were mostly friends of Dorothy. Kraft would assault his victims, which continued this way until he was arrested when police officers pulled him over for erratic driving. Even when he got pulled over, Kraft got out of his car and politely walked to the police cruiser. But with police officers also suspicious of his driving, they walked Kraft back to his car where they saw body of Kraft's latest victim dead in the passenger seat. Autopsies then showed that his victim had been strangled with a belt. Shocked at what the police saw, they detained him and ran a background check on him. The background check resulted in a previous arrest in 1966 for indecorous conduct in Huntington Beach. He graduated from college in 1967 with a degree in economics and has also been a member of the Air Force, which lasted only a year. He was discharged on grounds related to indecent behavior. Kraft was arrested again in 1975 for lewd conduct, and he spent five days in jail this time and also paid a small fine. Officers searched Kraft's car and discovered 47 photos of several young men in various conditions. A briefcase also housed a notebook with more than 60 messages in a code. These findings were then extended to Kraft's home, where they found the photos of three men whose mysterious demise are still not solved yet in Southern California. Robert Loggins had been found dead in September of 1980, and pictures of his body were seen in Kraft's home. Roger Duvall and Jeffrey Nelson were last seen in February of 1983, and their bodies were found days apart. Photos of the two friends were also discovered in Kraft's house. Investigators also noted that the fibers from a rug in Kraft's garage were the same as those found on the body of Scott Hughes, who was found alongside the Riverside Freeway in April of 1978. The properties of a man located near Grand Rapids, Michigan were also seen in Kraft's home. Not all the deaths could be pinned on him, though, as Kraft had been working for a Santa Monica-based aerospace firm between 1980 and January 1983 and had traveled to offices in Oregon and Michigan during the time that some of these unsolved murders in each state were discovered. Remember the briefcase that housed a notebook with more than 60 messages in a code? The law enforcement agencies and prosecutors were able to crack the code in Kraft's notebook. The codes were like mission topics, mainly in two letters. Two and one hitch refers to the murders of Nelson and Duvall. Marine Carson is regarded as Richard Keith, a Marine last seen in Carson, California, and whose body is discovered in Laguna Hills in 1978. Jail out referred to a murder he committed hours after being released from jail on June 11, 1978. Parking lot talked about the murder of Keith Crotwell, a dead eight-year-old boy whose body was discovered by a group of fishermen. His body turned up a while later. Kraft was called in this case, and he admitted seeing Crotwell in a parking lot that day he vanished. For this reason, Kraft was considered a scorecard killer. In September of 1983, the courts and prosecutors were ready for Kraft. The charges against Kraft were 16 murders, 11 counts of indecorous conduct, 9 counts of assault and mutilation, and 3 counts of robbery. The following January, prosecutors on Kraft's case dug up more information and they filed a written notice with their intent to prove 21 additional murders, which ran for 12 years across three states. Kraft was found guilty of these offenses and, as a result, was given the death sentence. Unlike other killers that have confessed to their crimes, Kraft has disregarded all allegations made towards him and has ignored the attention his crimes have gathered. He has never offered any explanation or interest in clearing any of the unsolved allegations made towards him. Due to his unwillingness to provide information about his crimes, law authorities may never know about his criminal history. But due to his extensive traveling, an estimate pegs the murder count to as high as 70. Regardless, he is also awaiting execution on the death row list in San Quentin State Prison, California. Which of these death row inmates look the most dangerous to you? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below.